hello everyone. Good evening and welcome to this latest University of Sussex uh, Ask the Experts series. Uh, I'm Jim Arkadili. I'm a professor of physics at the University of Surrey, not to be confused with the University of Sussex, although a lot of people do, Surrey and Sussex. However, the two universities have very close ties. I know a lot of the people in the physics department and indeed the, 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 the panelists uh, this evening. Uh, University of Surrey and Sussex are both part of what's called the, um, the Southeast Physics Network, uh, SEPNET. In fact, both universities were, were among the six original partners of that network, uh, which involves all physics departments now uh, among 10 universities in the Southeast of England. Anyway, um, this is the second Ask the Expert online event run by Sussex. The first one was back in March, uh, and that was on COVID-19. Now, the aim of these events is to showcase and, and, and give an insight into some of the University of Sussex's most important areas of research, and of course, which will and do have great societal impact. Now, the Ask the Expert series brings together panelists a panel of world leading experts in their field from the University of Sussex. So thank you very much to the panelists uh, uh, this evening who've made their time to be part of this debate about all things quantum. Okay, well, not, not all things, but I think we'll, there'll be a theme I imagine going running through the next, the next hour or so. Um, uh, the, the, the way it works is that pan I will introduce the panelists, they'll say something about their work and their interest and in their research. Uh, 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 for a few minutes each, and then we'll come to the Q&A and you can get to ask them questions and, and we had questions that have been flooding in uh, already. Okay, um, so basically it, the, the topic is in general quantum mechanics and its applications, but in particular the new technologies that are evolving, what we do call quantum technologies that are emerging from uh, current areas of, of research. Now, if you'd like to ask the panel anything, then please add your questions into the Q&A bar whenever they occur to you, right? These will then get transferred and, and we, 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 we will deal with them when we come to them uh, later on. A lot of very organized people have sent their questions in, in advance, of course. Okay, so without further ado, I will introduce our four panelists for this evening. Um, the, the first um, panelist is Professor Winfried Hensinger, who is head of the Iron Quantum Technology Group at Sussex. He's also director of the Sussex Centre for Quantum Technologies and co-founder of Universal Quantum, which is a full stack quantum computing startup company. And he serves on the EPSRC's uh, Physical Sciences Strategic Advisory Team. EPSRC is the funding council which funds uh, the research in, in, in quantum, uh, uh, quantum technology. So, Winnie Hensinger, welcome, and over to you to say a few words. Thank you, Jim, for, for this lovely introduction. So, I came to Sussex in 2005, and uh, that was a time when people kind of rolled their eyes when we we're thinking about quantum computers. Now, let me start, what is a quantum computer? A quantum computer is a machine that can solve certain problems where even the fastest supercomputer might take billions of years to calculate. And how does it work? It uses such things as teleportation and superposition. An object can be at two different places at the same time. Now, <clears throat> this is tremendously hard to build a machine that can do these things. So we started in 2005 trying to develop that uh, machine like that. And what we use is individually charged atoms or ions and we hold them inside a vacuum system. And so people use this type of technology before to build very stable clocks to define time, to define frequency. But <clears throat> then people got the idea we can hold and control these atoms so well that it can control the quantum effects with such precision that we can use them to build such quantum computers. And so we started in 2005 with a fantastic team of, of really outstanding uh, scientists and we worked very, very hard. And, and one of the things we started developing is the idea of using microwave technology 
to do calculations inside this quantum computer. So previously, people used pairs of laser beams. Now, that works really well when you have a handful of quantum bits. But imagine you need a million quantum bits. Imagine you'd need to manipulate a million quantum bits and you'd have to align all million pairs of laser beams. So we invented a new way to use microwaves and that allowed us to come up with an approach to quantum computing where you simply apply voltages to a microchip in order to execute calculations inside this quantum computer. In 2018, we led a international consortium made from Google and many leading universities. And we published the first construction plan of how you go about building a practical quantum computer that could host millions of qubits and would be capable of solving some of the really important problems. To put this into context, machines you have currently available at Google or IBM hold maybe 70 or 80 qubits. And so in 2018 was a big year because then we also started um, getting together a company which would take practical steps to build such machines. And so I'm actually also in my job in a quantum superposition of leading a research group at Sussex, but also being chief scientist of this company where we do the really hard engineering in order to build practical machines. Now, I think I've got pretty much a dream job because when I started, I wanted to be science officer on the enterprise. I was in primary school and kind of, I think I'm very close to that job. I used teleportation in my day-to-day -day job. I work with the most outstanding scientists uh, you can imagine. I've got a lab full of the most maddest and craziest machines, all with one goal in order to build machines that can solve problems we couldn't solve before. That might mean create new uh, pharmaceuticals create new materials and do things we couldn't do any other way before. But that's the big, that's the big mission. There's also the day to day. And I want to show you something which really excites me. So around five minutes ago, I got a text for my students and I want to show you this. I don't know whether you can see this. You can see here on my phone a string of lines and they managed as of around 15 minutes ago, hold in one of the most advanced quantum computing prototypes, managed to demonstrate first holding a string of ions, which is a really, really fantastic step. So I'm a very, very lucky man working in an area where we can really do so many amazing things. And, and I, I think maybe I, I want to show you a little bit of the enthusiasm uh, because this is a really new, fantastic emerging technology. And I'm, I think I'm very lucky to, to work in this field. So maybe that's a good introduction. I'm very happy to, to have lots of questions later. Thank you very much, Winnie. That's a very nice introduction, actually. I, and I've already got questions to ask you, but I, I won't. I'm, I'm not going to hog, hog the, the, the question time. Uh, we'll leave it. We have so many questions coming in that uh, we don't need me adding to them as well. Um, so thanks for that. OK, so now our, our second panelist, uh, very brave, because she is a PhD student. So this is Shabita Bumbra. Welcome, Shabita. Um, she's studying for PhD in uh, quantum physics of ultra cold atoms. Now, this is within the quantum systems and devices group, part of the uh, physics and astronomy department at, at Sussex. So Shabita, welcome. And maybe you can say a few words about what your PhD is on. Thank you, Jim. Yes, uh, I'm a I'm PhD student. Um, and I work with Peter, who we're going to hear from next. And we work on a very different side of quantum technology than what we just heard about from Winnie. We work on quantum sensors. We try to develop quantum sensors. So um, what I mean when I say quantum sensors is we have a system that has some kind of quantum property or effect that we're going to try and use to measure something. So in, in my PhD, in my work, I'm trying to measure magnetic fields. And I use, as Jim mentioned earlier, I use uh, ultra cold atoms and, and it's by getting them so cold that we get the quantum property that we use to measure the magnetic fields. Um, and this has a huge range of applications um, from uh, biomedical research to uh, material science and because of the, the, the huge range of applications we actually need uh, people from all sorts of disciplines to 
help get this technology working towards those specific applications. And uh, I actually don't have a physics background um, doing this physics PhD. Uh, my background was in, uh, I did my undergraduate degree in uh, biochemistry and genetics. And, uh, and since then I've also done some electronics work and uh, I guess part of what got me um, excited and invested in doing this PhD is um, the collaboration and the, the, the mishmash of, of, of all the different technologies and, and disciplines that you need to get it to work. We actually, um, I'm actually working with, a, uh, uh, with physicists and also a uh, material scientist here um, in, in just our little lab, our little experiment alone. And I'm sure Peter's gonna tell us more about the other things under his umbrella. Thanks. Thanks very much, Shavita. Yeah, I, clearly a sign that probably the exciting research that goes on in this field is done by people like you who are interdisciplinary, having a background in, in genetics, electronics, you know, bringing all these different ideas together. So it's a very exciting time. Well, as you say, your, your supervisor, your boss, <laughs> is our next panellist. That's Professor Peter Kruger. Now, Peter is the uh, research professor of experimental physics and head of the Quantum Systems and Devices Research Group, uh, as well as the founding director of the Sussex Programme for Quantum Research. Peter, welcome. Yeah, thank you, Jim, and thank you, Winnie and Shabita, for your very enthusiastic introductions to um, what quantum is and can be and, and has been. And I think it's Certainly, if we're asking the question, is the, is the future quantum? I think we can already see from what those two have told us that the, the present is a very exciting time for, for quantum. And, and of course, the past has been, and I have certainly believed for all of us, the future is quantum. But maybe for all of you, I'm very happy to have to see that almost 300 people are, are joining us today. Um, so a little bit about myself. So I, I started to be interested in, in quantum physics, quantum in general, when I was in a high school student in the early 1990s, I didn't understand anything about what quantum was then. And I don't really know why I was interested, but it was fascinating to see that there was so much talk already then about what quantum is. A lot of, it seemed to be a big intellectual challenge to understand it because it was like the synonym for things that cannot be understood. And I think we should be far away from that now. And anyway, I did go to to university in, in Berlin at the time, by the way, the place where quantum was first incepted by, by Planck a hundred years earlier. And, um, and went to my first quantum theory lecture, still didn't understand anything, was a bit taken aback by that, but uh, I, I noticed that quantum physics had been very important in explaining things that, that we have been using for quite a while now, from lasers to medical imaging, MRI, transistors, electronics, even classical computers wouldn't exist in the way they do without quantum physics. So that was very important, but it, I guess a bit of a relief was then to, to see that actually no one had really understood quantum fully, I think. And I think it was Richard Feynman who said, a famous quantum physicist, of course, if you think you've understood quantum physics, you only prove that you've not understood anything. So that was a bit of a relief after that first lecture. But, but what, what was fascinating then in the late 90s when I saw my first uh, real research experiments, quantum teleportation was the first experiment I saw was that some of the old more philosophical debate people bet uh, between people like Einstein and Bohr already in the 1930s for the, what, what it means that particles are also waves and waves are also particles it was suddenly had become accessible to experiments. And that was important. That actually drove me to, from wanting to become a theoretical physicist to, to ultimately becoming an experimental physicist because experiments could suddenly say something about this. The experiments had become so good, the control of quantum systems um, was possible in, to such a high level that uh, these old philosophical questions could suddenly be answered at least in part and we, gained a better understanding of the foundations of quantum physics. But what is more to say in the last 20 years then, sort of throughout my active research career, while these fundament fundamental aspects are still important, we're still trying to understand quantum systems 
better than before and, and make them more complex, build them up from scratch and see how particles interact in different dimensions and whatnot. But um, the techniques that have become available have allowed us to turn quantum physics to quantum technology and we're trying to bring it outside the laboratory. And that is what we call quantum technologies now. And um, you know, fascination from Winnie about computers is one aspect, but there are many others. There are quantum sensors, Shabita mentioned it a bit, and, and, um, and other aspects like communication and, and um, secure processing of information and so on. And, and this, this has been, this is now possible and I think is the reason why we're having this debate and why so many people outside of the physics domain become interested in this. And, and, and you know, there's investment flowing in, startup companies and so on, you've heard about it. So that's quite important. So in our field, we do a lot. In our group, uh, we do a lot of this work now. And uh, this relates largely to magnetic field sensing as Shubita mentioned, but it has many applications from the very microscopic understanding of minute current flows in materials and in electric vehicle batteries up to understanding the, the, the small magnetic fields that exist outside the human brain where we can, we've just in our lab been able to detect the difference of a person being asleep and being awake or rather having their eyes closed and having their eyes open, not through looking at the eyelids, which would be too easy, but by looking at the, um, at the actual brain activity that is manifest in magnetic fields that we can measure outside the human brain. So interesting stuff ahead. I think the future is quantum, not only for us, but for many. And I look forward to any questions that uh, all of you might have. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Peter. Yes, you're right. I think you know, it's, it's, it's quantum technologies isn't just about um, applications that can be commercialized or, or whatever. It, it's, it's also about actually testing some of these really deep, profound questions that in the past have just been the domain of philosophy. Now we're finally able to do experiments, build devices, make measurements that actually answer some of these deep questions. Uh, and I think, you know, some of the questions coming in uh, this evening are going to, to be uh, speaking to that. OK, so our, our fourth panelist is Dr. Alessia Pasquazi, who is a reader in the Department of Physics and Astronomy and director of the Emergent Photonics Lab. Uh, she's a researcher in the Sussex Centre for Quantum Technologies. She's also editor of uh, one of the editors of the Scientific Reports Journal, part of the Nature Publishing Group. Alessia, welcome. Jim, thank you very much. So, and thanks for uh, everybody for uh, having uh, um, for listening to me today. So I am the photonic expert of the group. So let's start and start to say uh, what is uh, photonics about. So photonics uh, is uh, the science of light. So you may wonder why I'm not calling it optics because uh, you don't call your computer an electrical machine. You call it an electronic machine. And in this world, electronic, we put the concept that this technology is based on a specific particle, a specific quantum particle that is the electron. From at the same time, the word photonics takes in itself all the, the concept of the fact that we have a technology that is based on the basic quantum particle of light, that is the photon. So in photonics, uh, you can do many things. It's one of the, the cornerstone of uh, uh, quantum technologies, uh, your lasers uh, that uh, we use every day from surgery to telecommunication or the, the, the internet communication. Everything is really, really based on uh, this type of technologies. But like everybody else here, I'm focusing on a specific uh, problem for what will be our future technology. And I specifically work at uh, building the Lancet of a portable atomic clock. Now, this is a very, very specific type of, uh, type of problem, but it's extremely, extremely interesting because uh, why clocks are important? You, we can do many things with clocks. So you have to think that all the internet, all the communication, they all work because they are in sync. The uh, electrical energy that you get in your home work because it's very, very well synchronized. So all these things are really relying on the um, 
performancing of common technology that we have so far relying on a very good clock. But uh, in a little bit more of an interesting uh, twist, uh, if you have a very good timing and if you can take it with you and bring it around, you can also navigate and say where you are without the need of, for instance, the GPS. Now, the GPS is actually working with many atomic clocks that are uh, on, uh, on our head. But if you could have your atomic clock here, with a little bit of the quantum sensor that uh, people like Peter and, and others are developing, we could go and navigate without anything else. So I'm sorry for uh, the fun of Pokemon Go, there is no more hacking to do, but uh, also we could have much more security for uh, imagine self-driving cars. So really it's a, a technology that would be enabling for many things. So how do we put a clock? on a mobile phone like this one. There will be a little bit of, a, of, a, of, a, of a, some long way to go, but the important thing is to make small and efficient the two main parts of a clock. As every clock, if you think to your grandpa clock, an atomic clock is done by a reference and a counter. So if you think to the grandpa clock, the reference is the pendulum. So and this pendulum, in the case of the best clock in the world, oscillate at the frequency of light. So this is something like 200, 300 terahertz. Nothing can count so fast. So what can we do? We need to build up a reduction gear. And the Beautiful idea that uh, John Hawley and Theodore Hench had, they got the Nobel Prize in 2005 for this, is that instead of counting the frequency of light, if you are able to synchronize perfectly the pulses of a laser to this frequency, you can simply count the pulse. And they solved an incredible problem. Thanks to them, we have clocks that are accurate to 10 to the minus 18 seconds. And we are very lucky also for another point because here in Sussex, we have Matthias Keller that unfortunately is not with us today, but he's one of, the, of our leader that is capable of doing these portable references in very, very small boxes, something in a box like that. Me, myself, I'm almost able to fit it in a mobile phone. So how we do that? We need to make a very good pulse laser, but when you want to put things in a chip, you have to start to remove all the bits and pieces that common laser have. So we are now really working at the minimum physics possible. And uh, we are using actually a very interesting phenomenon, a sort of natural phenomenon to get out these pulses from a laser. It is the same phenomenon that the muscles of our hearts use to have an, a pulsing heart. The pulsing heart works because all of our muscles are synchronized together and they give this periodic beating that you feel in here. The same thing, this type of phenomenon that is called synchronization is used by the cicadas to sing all together. They do not know what is going on. They just sing together because they are in sync. And so I don't have, a, I, I have a cup to, to, show my, to show my results. The beauty is that we are able, inside a very small chip that could fit a phone, we are able to synchronize all the modes of our laser. You see it here. So this is a real spectrum that we had. All these lines are all modes of the laser and they are all in sync. So what it means that if you take uh, and you measure the light out of it, you will see pulsing. So you can use these pulses to measure the frequency of the super cool clock that Matthias is doing, basically downstairs my lab. So this type of synchronization phenomena is called an emergent phenomena. And it's a very multidisciplinary type of uh, phenomenon that you find everywhere in, uh, in physics. So that is why my lab is called the Emergent Photonics Lab, uh, because we work on uh, this type of, uh, of, of physics. So we, we call it uh, for short, uh, we call Epic Lab for short. And we will need, uh, is a sort of good luck name. We will need a little bit of good luck, but I think that eventually it would be super epic to have a, a, a clock that is accurate with 10 to the minus 18 seconds that basically works uh, like the synchronization of the single chicago. 
Thank you very much, Alicia. Okay, so I want a, I want that mug. <laughs> I want to see, and and then I want I want a clock that's accurate to, to, to better than one in a trillionth of a second on my on my smartphone. That's so. This this is the future. This is how the quantum technology really in in our hands. It's, it's amazing stuff. Okay, well, look, this is an Ask the Experts event, right? So we've heard from all the four experts. Let's get to ask them some questions. Um, so questions have been flooding in. I, I'm going to try and ask as many as I can. Um, I think what I'll try and do is, is aim questions at particular panelists, but of course, if other panelists feel they want to sort of chip in and add something, uh, please do. But just advice to my, to my panelists, uh, let's try and get through as many questions as we can. I don't want, I don't want us to sort of get bogged down for, for 10, 15 minutes just answering one question because there are, there are just so many here. Unsurprisingly, there are quite a few on quantum computers. So let's deal with two or three of those uh, first. Um, so this is a, um, the first question is from my namesake from another gym. Uh, and I think, uh, yeah, we just thank, thank you Winnie for turning on your, your video because I am gonna come to you. Uh, so Jim asked this, is there any evidence that quantum computers are faster than conventional computers in practice, not just in theory? You're, you're muted though still. Oh, good, excellent. Um, yeah, so, so the advantage of quantum computers is that they really utilize an entirely different working principle as, as conventional computers. And, and in a way it makes use of the principle of superposition and that means that a bit rather than bit zero or one can be zero and one at the same time. Now, building on these uh, rather strange quantum phenomena, you can uh, come up with a new type of algorithm, a quantum algorithm. And for certain problems, the speed up is just tremendous. And, and what does that mean, a tremendous speed up? It means that for certain problems, a uh, problem that would take even the fastest supercomputer in the world millions of years to solve, a quantum computer may solve in, in minutes or days. And so these problems are well known. A famous one is a break in RSA encryption. For me, that's not very exciting, but it's a, it's a famous application, creating new pharmaceuticals, understanding chemical reactions or doing Optimizations, for example, in financial problems, portfolio optimization is a very important application. Also, uh, simulating flows, it means, for example, making better aircraft wings. Right? One could even imagine uh, understanding weather forecasts better. Uh, so, there's a whole range of applications, and the development of quantum computers goes hand in hand with the applications with the app development of new applications. And so this is a really exciting time where we see every day new applications being developed. And obviously we also work very hard to build practical quantum computers that can tackle these. What you're saying, Winnie, is that, um, that there, are, there are conventional tasks that, that our current non-quantum classical computers do, which we will continue to use because they do them very well. But there are cer these certain specific tasks that quantum computers are going to be particularly well suited for, uh, and 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 they can do them much more quickly, much more effectively than any supercomputer we have today. That's right. Don't think you will have this on your on your desk. Everybody will have a desk. It's, it's really for particular applications. Right. I, I still want one on my desk, though. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so the 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 next question is from Professor Sir David Clary, who asks. Um, the idea of a quantum computer has grabbed the imagination, but there's so much hype and speculative claims for imminent breakthroughs. Some say that major new developments in material science are needed to achieve a useful quantum computer. Would you agree? Maybe, Peter, can you say something to this? I can try. Um, I, I think I would agree. I think um, in even though we've had a lot of tremendous development, and I think to in, in the context of the previous questions, we've seen so much success in, in, in early developments of, of um, quantum computing, yet I'd say we're it's still early days in, in the sense that there's still multiple platforms that, that are considered for this. So that could be um, a solid state based platform. It could be an ion based platform like, like Winnie is using, or it could be something 
And um, all of these um, platforms with, which have demonstrated early operation of the principles of a quantum computer work, which is a great milestone to have achieved, they have to be scaled up to much larger size. And I'm fascinated by Winnie's project to do precisely that. Um, others do the same and the big computing companies all got onto this. So IBM is doing this, Microsoft is doing this, Google is doing this. So all have their projects of scaling up quantum computers in various platforms, various ways of, of realizing this quantum bit that Winnie mentioned in, in practice. And all of them uh, have to deal with, with how that works and, and how when you make things big and multiply it many times over, defects become more and more important. And I think materials, just like we've seen in the semiconductor industry for classical computers that over the last, I don't know, 50, 100 years has, has been developed so much. Material science and how to make materials better has always played a tremendous role. And I think is absolutely essential here. And yes, this is one of several developments that we need to uh, control better. And that's also where this interdisciplinarity comes in. All the different fields have to work together to make this big dream a reality. Winnie, would you also agree? Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and to, to maybe delve a bit more in, into the question, so this is really about one particular platform, uh, the idea to build quantum computers make, made out of silicon chips where the qubit is embedded inside the, the silicon chip. And indeed, um, David Clary is very right that we need more advances in the material science to make such a quantum computer happen. The advantage would be could be a very small quantum computer. You could, um, in a in a way, that might be a quantum computer you could have eventually in your desk. But there, we really need a lot many more years to develop this. And mm. we're kind of cheating the system a little bit by having I we use silicon microchips, but the qubit is not embedded inside the microchip. It actually levitates a hundred microns above the chip, and so that makes it easier to isolate the qubit from the environment. And again. Uh, releases the pressure on making advances in material science to build a practical quantum computer. Thank you. Um, so before we move on uh, away from quantum computers, uh, I, there may be others coming up later, but here's another one. Maybe this one's for you, Alessia, uh, because you talked about the uh, the technologies that are you know emerging with quantum sensors and more, more advanced atomic clocks and so on. Um, the question is this, is quantum computing, and, but I guess it applies to various other quantum technologies as well, is quantum computing like nuclear fusion always 40 years away? In terms of the, the time scale of these technologies, how far away are we really from realising them? I love to, to talk about uh, how, uh, where are the quantum computers with me here, so I, can, I, well, just, I can blame on you. So yeah, exactly. uh, I think that uh, the, the general question on, uh, on quantum technology is that there are some parts of the technologies that are uh, already practically ready to be packed in some of them that are a little bit more uh, more far away so i will take the i will take the uh, the perspective from uh, another point of view also from my point of view to tell you that photonics is perfect because we are ready we are ready to enter in the chips and uh, to uh, to uh, to stay with uh, with electronics so all the bits and pieces that require uh, photonic uh, uh, mixing uh, uh, and uh, uh, technologies are much, much closer to, to, to arrive there. All the bits and pieces that instead require to uh, really handle the, the fermions, so to, to take uh, to the other side, so to, to handle ions, to handle electrons, to, to handle particles, and that uh, I, will, uh, I will leave it to my, to my colleagues to comment on that. Those are really the technologies that are pushed at the moment, but we need to push them at certain point because we need to see this uh, design somewhere. We need to see the bits there. And so what I really love of, of uh, Winnie's work is that he has the bits to build the, the technology with the processing of silicon. So like my, my clock, like my, my, my result here, that is silicon ready, that is important. Winnie's is silicon ready. That means that when he is, will be ready, he will be able to print out his results, his, his computer on something that can 
go mainstream. And this is the same for us. So when we will be ready to do it, we will be able to print this thing together with the with electronics. So we have mm. a lot of thinking on this in, uh, in quantum tech in general. Do you agree, Woody, that uh, we are closer than uh, many people think? Because we hear a lot you know, in the news of you know, quantum supremacy and all the sort of nonsense about you know, who's actually finally built a quantum computer. And then you realize, eh, maybe it wasn't quite what we had hoped for. How far away would you say? So I'll make this very personal. When I started in 2005 at the University of Sussex, many of my colleagues, I'm not going to name any names, or people in general rolled their eyes when I said, I'm going to build a quantum computer. And, and the word quantum technology, nobody even used that. And, and things have changed. There was a national quantum technology program in the UK, which was organized. And, and, and suddenly, like, it was a lot of funding to make things really happen. And in 2018, maybe a lot of breakthroughs happened. And, and, and so I think the last few years have really showed that quantum computing is moving fast forward. We see these major companies are engaging. Like and nearly any financial company will engage now with quantum computing. And they don't do that out of naivety or because they feel like they, they need to throw a bit of money around, but they're because they're now it is happening and it is happening. You see machines that can do useful things. All the proof of principle phenomena have been shown. And as Alesia pointed out, we are now setting out to build silicon microchips. We do this as part of the, 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 my, my company, Universal Quantum, where we now hold ions above the silicon microchip and do real world calculations. So we are now really moving away from simple academic work to build practical machines. And, and this is something I, I want to say also maybe for, for the coming generation. It could not be a more exciting time to get into quantum technologies because what we're going to see is a real technology re revolution where we're mm. going to see these technologies be coming to fruition. And, and so I, I think it's a fantastic time for, for, for quantum computing and quantum technologies in general. Thank you. Um, Shabita, I want to come to you and I'm going to... Uh, I will be asking you a, a more technical question later on. Don't, don't you worry about that. But I, but I, I want to start, start you in gently because there's a, nice, a lovely question here asking what's it like to be a student, a research student in such a cutting edge field? Um, I think uh, I'll, I'm going to be very honest with my answer. <laughs> that, that, that's always good. <laughs> I think so, sometimes it is exciting, but obviously you're working here, so sometimes it's mundane and sometimes it's frustrating. I think it's in any research um, position. Uh, yeah, but I found that because uh, there are so many different disciplines here, um, everybody is very understanding of your ignorance in certain areas and will take the time to help you catch up with things because they're having to do the same thing in different areas. Um, and so I feel very thankful, uh, very lucky for that. Um, and I, I do very much enjoy working here. A question here from Maya who asks, can you discuss quantum technologies applicable in healthcare? Peter, do you maybe like to answer that one? Yeah, uh, happy to. Um, and the others can chip in if they want to add, but I, I think it's, it, it, there's, there's a sort of the short term and the longer term answer to this. And, and the, in the longer term, we've already heard about drug design and uh, you know, pharmaceutical companies thinking about quantum computers and how they can influence therapies perhaps in the future. And that's, I would class that as more long term. On the short term, however, we've already seen that quantum sensors outperform classical sensors in, in, in numerous modalities of sensing and in part of particular importance for the, for, the, for the biomedical imaging is magnetic sensing. We know that MRI is one of the success stories of, of more recent medical instrumentation and that's a medical resonance imaging based on, uh, sorry, magnetic resonance imaging. So that's already based on magnetic fields. Improvements of that, for example, to get away from these very large, heavy, expensive superconducting magnets in MRI can be facilitated with ultra low field magnetic resonance imaging as it's now tested in, in laboratories. So we probably see that soon in medical practice. The other area that I've been lucky enough to, to work in myself is um, magnetoencephalography. Now here we have something where quantum sensors are so 
sensitive that we can passively just listen to the brain. We don't do what we do in x-rays, but we, we, we try to radiate some, radiate the brain with some, some, something from the outside and measure what comes out to the other end. We don't try to stimulate it like we do with, with the magnetic resonance imaging conventionally, but we simply listen to the um, neurons firing in the brain and that create, that's electromagnetic and it creates a small magnetic field that even exists outside the brain. We can pick it up and measure it. And I think that is one of the fascination for me that already today we have this and um, we just have to go through practicalities and approvals and so on. So we have to even interdisciplinarity will then extend to lawyers, not my domain, but you know, this is where we're at. So I think we really are there for medical applications. Very fascinating. It is very fascinating, very exciting. Um, uh, another question, actually, this, this one for, for you, Alessia, because uh, it, it's exactly following on from what you were talking about. It's a question from Ashley, who asks, um, he said, I, I read something about the use of quantum technology to provide super accurate sensors. How practical is this or is it purely theoretical? Well, you, you, you've talked about it. But the, the example here that, that Ashley gives is, is lifting an atomic clock slightly changes the gravitational pull on that clock, allowing height to be measured. And quantum interferometers can measure minute variations in gravity. So utility companies could find buried pipes or for oil companies to find oil or gas pockets. Is that something that's being looked at? Of course, yes, yes, yes. This is, uh, so this is one of the, basically of the reason while uh, we are really going, uh, going there in quantum sensing. Because uh, now this, this micro, uh, this, this very small, uh, small deviation, they are, so they are very, uh, very much answered in, uh, in all uh, uh, quantum, uh, quantum type, uh, type of sensors. And one, one point of this will be to make them uh, small and portable. So that is all, uh, all this, uh, this story about basically. So the, uh, the first uh, uh, quantum technology program, uh, uh, the, the first round uh, had a lot of focus uh, exactly in doing these, uh, these very small and portable uh, devices. Uh, and it has been impressive to see how much of a, uh, of a progress has been done in that. Again, similarly, so they, uh, they are now things that can be transported. So you can now fit them uh, and bring, bring them outside the lab. Now, really, the, the push will be to, to put them on, uh, on some electronics. And then we will see the interesting, uh, the interesting thing. I wonder, maybe, Winnie, you want to, to comment on that? Because I, I wonder how much of, uh, of your, uh, let's say, uh, I know that both you and Peter, you are really working in putting these, uh, these devices on, uh, on chips and uh, trap the system on uh, on integrated uh, on integrated circuits. So maybe you can uh, give a better perspective in terms of number on when we will be there with this. So, so yeah, this is very much the center of, of the uh, company we've, we, we found at Universal Quantum. So I started leading a research group building practical quantum computers. And so you build proof of printed principle machines and you, the, the chips you make are you make in university clean rooms, which kind of like is all a bit of a, um, um, these chips aren't very high yield and, and very reliable. And so now in the company, we make these fully integrated silicon microchips with all the advanced features. And, and we do this in foundries rather than university clean rooms. So that, that means like the yield and the precision you make these chips with are, are, are just amazing. So, so the next step is obviously to now deploy these chips in practical quantum computer prototypes. And, and so that's what we're working on. The timescale for that is maybe three to five years where we have practical first quantum computers that can do useful and interesting things. The timescale to build machines that can solve problems, really, really hard problems. We're still looking around 10 years. But, but it's worth the while, because if you think about some of these problems, if you can solve them, it's, it's, it's in a way really disruptive. It changes the way we do things similar, I mean, maybe in nature to the Google search algorithm and, and, and other disruptive technologies. Uh, I'm just checking the time and, and, and seems to be going by very quickly. So we, we should move on. Um, 
Shabita, a question for you, uh, only because I know you've come, you've come into this field from a different background. How do you explain why a non-physics background investor should care about quantum technologies? Uh, do they try to understand what exactly makes it different or are they just going to trust the scientists? You know, and, and, and how is that convincing these people? How is that different, say, from applying for, for research grants within the field? This technology, especially, you know, what I'm working with, the sensing, and that can be um, applied across fields, like, say, um, a scanning electron microscope or an MRI machine um, is applied so broadly um, and has assisted in so many different ways. Um, that is a, a similar place that this, this sensing technology can uh, be. We're all talking about these quantum technologies, getting very excited about what the future might hold. But for someone who, who, doesn't, who, who knows the word quantum and knows that it's weird and it's, and it's difficult to understand, and they may have heard of you know, Schrodinger's cat in the box and nothing else, how do you enthuse them that quantum technologies are something different, something fresh, something that we need to invest in? Yeah, I, th I think it's, it's not so much the storytelling, actually. It is in the end, especially when you talk about the transition from the money coming from some government funds to, to going to, to be from really private sector investments. I think here you really have to demonstrate milestones that these things work. And I think it is very important that we don't only talk about the quantum computer, even, even though as exciting as it is, because in the, in the quantum sensing area in particular, we, we have applications today. We have measured brain signals with these things. We have um, improved our clocks to measure one part in I don't even know what 10 to the 18 is and how many trillions it is, but, <laughs> but it, it, is a, it is a huge number, right? And, and magnetic fields that are a trillion times smaller than that of the earth, which is in itself small enough that it took a long time for people to measure. So I think um, demonstrating what we can do and showing people in laboratories and outside laboratories in particular. I mean, I remember one meeting where we showed that we can cool atoms to essentially zero temperature a gas of atoms to zero temperature, just simply by shining lasers onto it, simply, of course, um, in not in a lab, but inside a showroom of an of a industrial trade fair or in a, in a meeting room in the, of the European Commission in Brussels. This shows, this convinces people when you demonstrate that things mm -hmm. work mm -hmm. or Winnie showing a trapped iron to people that they can hold in their hand. I think these things matter and, and that's where we are at. And I think that's why we see so much push in the field at the moment. Thank you. Um, Winnie, a question for you. Uh, will quantum computing render current forms of cryptography useless? And will it allow previously encrypted content to be read? Is society prepared for having a universal quantum computer? Yes, um, indeed. So one of the very famous applications of quantum computers is the, that quantum computers in principle can break RSA encryption. Now, I should note to that, that that's probably one of the hardest applications in terms of hardware requirement for a quantum computer. So there's gonna be many applications which will become available before we're gonna break RSA encryption. Now, I wanna add a little side note. In 2018, we published the first construction plan of how to build such a machine. And we calculated how big such a machine would need to be. And we came, this machine would need to be nearly the size of a football pitch. It was a huge machine. And I want to go back to an earlier question where somebody said, so, so this is always 40 years away. Recently, we made some theory um, advances, significant theory advances. And we can now build a machine like that capable of breaking RSA encryption size four meters times four meters. Now, again, this is still one of the hardest applications and it's still at least 10 years away. So please relax. Nobody will immediately break your encryption. However, data which is now safe today in 10 years time or 15 years time may be able to be read. So that's certainly something we need to think about. Right now, people are already working to devise new ways to encrypt, um, which are then uh, now not to 
be broken in by a quantum computer. So we are right now working on new ways to encrypt information, making our, our information resilient to quantum computers. But I should maybe add as a, as, a, as a final note that with the introduction of quantum computers, we also need to think very carefully about how we deploy them in a society. And we need to think about regulation and societal implication. And that's certainly work we are starting right now. And it's very important with like with any new technology like AI to start now to do this work so we feel and can live safely and take maximum advantage on, of the opportunities and promises of this new technology. Thank you. OK, well, I think we've got time for a couple more questions. And I say a couple more because these are questions I want to address to all four of you. So I'm, I'm hoping you're going to give me snappy 10 to 20 second answers only. Otherwise, we run over time. The first one is this. If you could magically have a, a perfected quantum technology today, what would you choose? Okay. Peter, go on. I'm, I'm just going to look at you. <laughs> right. So, I, I mean, I am fascinated by the possibility of turning sensors into cameras. So I would like to have a, a camera that sees magnetic, electromagnetic activity or even gravitational fields over large areas with high resolution. Okay, great. Alessia? I think eventually everybody would like to see graduated their own baby, right? So, and uh, I think uh, I think that uh, it will be it will be great. It will be great to have these uh, these little cones in our computer because we, we will have a lot of very good things also for the for the telecom and other other good stuff. Right. Okay. Shavita. I think it's going to be equally as boring and selfish and say, I would like my PhD project to work. Absolutely <laughs> but, understandable. Uh, <laughs> no, um, I, I also, I really quite like the um, brain imaging that's going on over here. I, I'm not working on, I think that would be uh, amazing to see um, the applications of that working. Um, Great, right. Okay, Winnie, over to you. I wonder what you're going to say. <laughs> So, so with my head on as director of the Center for Quantum Technologies, I'm going to say the most diplomatic answer and say, like, all these quantum technologies ah. are simply amazing, and I will not <laughs> pick. But I will tell you one more thing, and that is I will build a quantum computer. Not tomorrow, but it will happen, and that's obviously where my personal excitement comes in. But I also want to advertise all the other fantastic quantum technologies, which are equally fantastic. And, and really, one more, one more pitch to everybody who is going to get into physics, this is the time to enroll in a physics degree. This is the time to develop practical quantum technologies. As, as you've heard, this, you know, quantum mechanics in any case is a very difficult subject. Developing some of these technologies is incredibly fascinating, but also incredibly complex. And uh, uh, we, we can't possibly do it justice in this just short one hour event. But hopefully it's given you a flavor of the sorts of things that are, that are going on and the sort of research that's going on at the University of, of Sussex today. I'd like to thank our four panelists, uh, Winnie Hensinger, Shabita Bumbra, Peter Kruger, and Alessia Pasquazi. Um, thank you all for, for your very clear and concise uh, answers. We could have gone on for much longer, of course. Uh, please look out for the next Ask the Expert event, which will be on the theme of consciousness. And that is due to take place later uh, the, towards the end of this year, but you will be hearing uh, announcements of it um, in the coming months. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thanks again to the panel and have a very good evening. Goodbye. <laughs>